Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. This is the beginning of the main part of the lecture series of this course and we will start small but with important things which are the methods of programming. When I say methods here uh, I'm using the Java, Java terminology it is functions, operations, and other programming languages. In this course, I will stick with method. So methods are the functions with functionality you call on objects as defined by the classes. And we will cover uh, the types of methods there are in this lecture, as well as the properties they may have. A good method really has exactly one type and falls into one of three major types. And a method may have multiple properties. Um, some of these properties are defined by the programming language, like a method can be abstract, but other method properties are only known to expert programmers. And that's the idea here. We're going beyond the programming language. Experienced software developers have a rich vocabulary when they talk about design and programming, uh, much of which or some of which is often not captured in textbooks and really exists only in the language of how developers talk with each other. And in this lecture, we'll get to some of that, not all of it, because it keeps evolving. So again, first method types and then method properties. So what's a method type? Well, it's a category of similar methods. So uh, a method type is really a classification uh, of methods into this type. And it should be about the main purpose of the method. Um, if it has one type of purpose, then it should not have multiples. So again, a method should have only one type. When you look at it, Maybe you can already infer this from your own experience, but when you look at practice, when you look at some textbooks, you can see that there are three different categories for method types. There are query methods, there are mutation methods, and there are helper methods, which have different definitions. And within these main categories, there are uh, specific method uh, types. One reason why we talk about method types, why we're interested is again to teach you the vocabulary of experienced software developers so that you can communicate more efficiently. And that is often tied to specific naming conventions, conventions of how to write a method. And if you know those conventions, and they're type specific, so I address them one by one. But if you know these conventions, then you'll be faster to grasp what a method does that you see in front of you on a screen in code. And you'll be able to write it faster and you're likely to make less mistakes. So naming methods, for example, programming them right, meeting the expectations of other experienced developers is a way of reducing bugs communicating more effect effectively in code and generally writing better software. We aforementioned three categories of method types are query methods, met mutation methods and helper methods. Query methods only return information about an object. They do not change its state. So the invariant here is the state of the object on which a query method is called will not change. A mutation method, in contrast, is a method designed to change the state of the object, uh, but not necessarily provide information back. Meaning a mutation method causes a hopefully well-defined transition uh, in the state space from one wallet, from one valid object state to another. And then there are helper methods which don't affect uh, the object at all, but provide some supporting utility function 
that uh, needs, for example, the information from the object but don't doesn't necessarily change it. There are many different method types that fall into these three main categories. Here are those that I will be, will be discussing in this lecture. But please be reminded, uh, these keep changing as programming languages evolve, as system architectures evolve and different contextual requirements lead to different and new styles of writing code and hence to new method types. So this is not cast in stone, though some of them like the good old getters and setters will probably be around forever. As an example, in this lecture and later lectures as well, I will be using homogeneous names. That's a fabulous example of a value type or data type, a fundamental one. Uh, homogeneous names. So it's a name, obviously. Homogeneous means it has multiple components of the same type. Uh, a domain name is a homogeneous name. Dub, dub, dub. Uh, Google.com has three components and um, these three components are of the same type. String and there's usually a delimiter care for the texture representation. It's not strictly logically needed. If you have three components, could be any delimiter care, but you usually want to print such names and then there's a default delimiter care, but there could be others. Um, path, paths or full-blown paths to a file in a file system or another example of homogeneous, na homogeneous names as are Java package names. They all are multiple components strung together to give you the full name. So it's a very common value type. Um, they are not heterogeneous. So a URL, for example, is a heterogeneous name built from other names like homogeneous names, for example, for the domain name. You can see a class here using UML notation on the right. And you can see actually lots of methods some of which we will look at in more detail in the rest of this lecture. There's one general rule of naming methods that we can pull forward before we even discuss any specific examples. And that general rule is that methods cause action or are part of action. And as a consequence, you want to choose a verb to indicate that something's happening. So not a noun, a verb, but you can add a noun to the verb if that meant then elaborates on what is being done. So get name is a good uh, method name, uh, much better than just name. So you should always use a verb. Uh, perform transaction is another reasonable uh, method name, though perhaps transact would be uh, better not good would be transaction. You always want a verb to indicate that it's a method as opposed to classes or packages, which are usually nouns. So then let's turn to the first category of method types, the query methods. The query methods, as mentioned, uh, will return information about an object, they query the object and some information is returned to the caller. The state of the object should not change logically, at least. And so the most well-known example of a query method is probably uh, the getter or the get method. So a get method is a query method that returns uh, a logical field of the object. If an object has a name, then you will probably have a get name get method to retrieve that name where you're querying the object but are not changing its state. The Java JDK has many examples of get methods. They are as uh, common as sand. So on an object, you can call get class, which will give you the class object. And on an enumeration or iteration, you can call next element and so forth. With that already, 
uh, you can see that not everyone always precisely follows the implied naming convention of um, having a verb but uh, as the name but it's still key and I think people will agree that this is what you should do. In my own homogeneous name example, uh, get component of a homogeneous name would be a good example. It would return the component at an index provided as an argument to the method call. So uh, on dub 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 jvalue.org, uh, get component uh, one with uh, counting starting at zero would return j value from dub 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 j value dot org so you already noticed the common prefix for get methods is get and after the get follows typically the field or the attribute the logical attribute of the object that is being asked for here's some simple example um, the homogeneous name class in this example stores the full name www.jvalue.org in a simple string and here it has another field which counts the number of components in that internal name field and uh, that's it so get methods here are to ask how many components are there return get no number of components or give me the uh, component at index position at index at some index position so get component of index and so forth another uh, very common query method is the boolean query method where you are asking about uh, an aspect or an attribute or field of an object or its logical state um, which as a return value can only be boolean so a generic getter can give you all kinds of return values uh, while as defined in the method signature but we don't know anything a get method uh, will define that but uh, um, could be in some case the get method will return a general object then as in another case a string and another case an integer boolean query methods return boolean because it's so common, they are called deliberately a Boolean query method. And uh, the perhaps most well-known example from the JDK is uh, equals, which really should have been called is equal. So in the homogeneous name example, we have a method called is empty, which would return true if there are no components in the homogeneous name. As you can infer, the common prefix to indicate the method whose name you're seeing is a Boolean query method is to start that name with is. Could also be has or may or can, but it's usually is, that's perhaps 80% of all cases. And then after the um, is, has, may something, um, the uh, specific aspect you want to know about is being follows on the on the is so here are some examples from homogeneous name again uh, boolean has components at index at uh, index uh, index and it will tell you whether it has a component so dub 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 jvalue.org has uh, three components so at index 0, 1, 2, there would be a component, and at 4, there won't be any. Um, is empty. There's a simple uh, calculation here is the number of components 0. Here you can also see the difference between the logical and abstract state uh, and an implementation state, as we will be discussing in future lectures. Sometimes there is information of fields that is functionally dependent on other uh, attributes or fields and is not explicitly represented as its own field. So for example, we have no empty Boolean flag. We derive using the comparison get number of components equals uh, zero as an implementation or as a uh, fill in for an empty field that we don't need because uh, if the number of components is zero, can be easily computed computed that would be the same 
Then, uh, now uh, still very common, but not as common as getters and Boolean query methods, the comparison method. So often you want to compare two objects on an ordinal scale. And um, so you want to be able to say that. And that is common, so common that it's uh, part of the root classes, key classes in the JDK, for example. And as you may know, there's the compare to method in the comparable interface that you need to implement then. And it will give you a minus one, zero or plus one for sm smaller, uh, equal or larger. And you, if you want to make your objects comparable, uh, then staying with the way how Java wants us to handle it, you'll have to implement the comparable interface by implementing and providing a compare to method with the aforementioned uh, convention of returning integers to indicate uh, smaller or lower um, on that ordinal scale, equal or higher or bigger. Yet another um, query method that is less obvious sometimes to people is the conversion method. A conversion method is a query method that takes the object or that's implemented on the class of the object and re returns a representation of that object in a different format, usually more condensed or smaller than the whole full-blown object you're querying. Um, usually it's a string representation of that object, but it could also be a JSON or an XML representation. Um, I don't quite like the word conversion method. Uh, I would have preferred if the world had decided to call it interpretation method. And that's because nothing gets converted here. You just get a different representation. You're not changing any state. Nothing is converted. You're just interpreting the object in representing the object in a new uh, you're creating a new representation of the object. You're not even changing the original object. So the JDK also gives us a good example uh, implemented on object, uh, class object already, the toString uh, method. Um, like with conversion, I don't like the toString because nothing has changed. I pre would have preferred if it was called, had been called as string. But there's a lot of uh, historic arbitrariness in the naming of the methods of classes in the Java JDK. So common prefixes are as, or the not so much liked by me, to for conversion methods. And then after this prefix, you usually provide uh, some indication of what form of representation that is as JSON as string. So homogeneous names, for example, can provide their content, uh, the different components and the name as a string array. And as a consequence, the conversion method for it is called as string array, as you can see here. And so what you have to do is take the internal representation of the object state uh, and get out the components and put them into a string array. And that's what you return to the caller. The homogeneous name object does not change. The string array is created in the as string array method and is returned to the caller. No state changes, it's a query method. The second, equally important to query methods, category of method types are the mutation methods. And mutation methods, as mentioned, will change an object's state. Ideally, uh, they are of such a nature that they make one well-defined state change. They trigger and execute one well-defined 
transition in the state space of the object as defined by its class. Not multiple, just one, because good methods have one purpose. And um, thereby they change the state of an object. Some argue, we'll come to design guidelines at the end again, uh, like Maye, argue that because they have this purpose of changing an object state, they should not also return information about the object. Even information whether some complex uh, method actually succeeded uh, should be provided through a separate method call. And hence, uh, mutation method should be of, should return, should be of void, should be void, should not return a value. So, the first common mutation method that you all know are the set methods, the setters. And that changes or sets, a set method sets an attribute uh, of the object to some value. So the thread class of the JV, JDK has a set priority method and hence you can set the priority of a thread. The name, um, well, the homogeneous name, has a set method set component where you can set the specific components. So in www.jvalue.org uh, you can replace the j value by setting uh, a new value to it. I leave it open. We will be talking about value objects and value types much later in this class, whether this will actually really change the object state as you would expect of a mutation method or does something else. But in general, mutation methods change the object's state. Prefix is set and after the set follows the attribute or the field or the logical aspect of the object that will be changed to a new value. So here is one implementation where you can change on a name object uh, indeed a specific component by at index i where you set the value of that component to uh, the provided string c. And um, that's straightforward. You simply replace the particular component. If it was a string array, you would just change the value at the position i. But um, here you can see I chose a more complex implementation, the purpose of which will become clear later on. I have a somewhat inefficient implementation where I insert a new value at the desired position and then remove the component or value that move, was moved up one uh, position. I remove that and that's equivalent to replacing uh, the particular component. Setters are specific as they make the assumption that you're not really causing a transition in the state space, but you're really just changing one attribute and that this will not put the object into an invalid state. More complex transitions, which might touch on multiple attributes that, that need to be changed in unison or together to uh, have the object start in a valid state and end in a valid state. That's what I mean by a valid transition in the state space. Such methods, such mutation methods um, are called command methods. It's some command being executed on the object. So uh, notifying uh, threads would be one, repainting something. And here in the homogeneous name example, it's insert uh, a component at a particular position or remove a component at a particular position. Uh, these are more complex than just setting a value. Common prefixes um, are handle, execute, make, though in general it's best if you find a name that's specific to what the complex functionality is about. So rather than execute transaction, transact might be a better name for a command method. Here are the, here's the insert method, uh, including 
split up into two. We will see that in future and later classes why we split up a method like insert a component C at index I. Uh, we will see that later. And it's split up into a publicly visible method, which uh, makes sure the method can be executed properly by ensuring that preconditions are met. And then there's the actual workhorse method do insert, which, uh, which will indeed put in at the specific index uh, the component that's being provided. And how that is implemented really depends on the implementation structure of, uh, of the homogeneous name. I haven't talked about that yet. It could be a string array. It could be just a string itself, uh, uh, which would lead to very different do insert implementations because if it's a string array, you just need to shift the array components. But if it's a single string, then you need to shift the characters in the string to make space for the new component. And hence, it would be different implementations. Another specific command method is the initialize uh, mutation method is the initialization method. This one is a common method that you set up or that you create to be called during the creation and the initialization of some service or object, usually just object. And so uh, it usually comes, gets a bunch of arguments that uh, will be set to respective corresponding fields in the object so that after executing an object's constructor and then the initialization method, um, the object starts out in a good state rather than in a broken state. You may argue or ask, why do I need that past a constructor? Well, uh, that has many reasons. Uh, an initialization method has uh, ex uh, knows that the object has already been created in memory. Uh, constructors often have limitations. In Java, it's okay, but uh, you still have its own crummy syntax on how you call on super constructors and what have you. In other programming languages like C++, um, the object has not even been fully constructed yet uh, as you run through the constructor hierarchy. And hence, if you wait for the system uh, itself to do the basic job of making sure the memory is there for your object and you then do a second run in initialization method across the higher levels of a hierarchy for example then you can rely on a properly constructed object which is why it's good practice to pull out the initialization of the object from the constructors once it gets more complicated and have an own initialization uh, call chain from the uh, class being instantiated. So um, these methods are often called initialize or sometimes init and then something. And sometimes they are competing uh, or multiple initialization methods with different arguments to the method to allow for different simpler or more complex ways of initializing the object. So, um, here is from some test code uh, initialization methods to uh, create different implementations of the homogeneous name class. You can see that there is the general name interface or class for homogeneous names. And then when you look at init names, I'm assuming here that there are two different classes that both our names are the subclasses or they implement the name interface called either string array name or string name. They correspond to what I already hinted at earlier. String array name has as an internal representation a string array, while string name just stores the whole homogeneous name, all components in a single string. So you need an initialization method to get your test objects in order to run your tests on them. And 
the third category of method types are helper methods. Helper methods, for example, are factory methods, which you may have heard about if you've taken a look at the design patterns book. So a factory method is a method, is a helper method that creates an object and returns it to the caller, to the calling client. And the object on which you called the factory method doesn't change. So it's not a mutation method. It's arguably not even a query method because the information being returned is not about the object. You're getting a new object. So you're not, the information you get back is not about the state of the object on which you call the factory method. The JDK gives you some, with the usual or with the comma so common, crummy naming, the value of uh, methods on class string, which return a string representation of some integer or double you pass in, that are those are factory methods. More commonly, um, the prefix for factory methods is uh, create, which I think is best. Sometimes it's make or build if there's a more complex building process behind it. You should not use uh, new or get new because wherever we can, we really should be using verbs to name uh, methods and be consistent. New is not a verb, um, even if everyone understands it and new is implicitly being made into a verb. It's still not that great. So after the prefix, after create, comes the type of the object being created. So create transaction or create picture or create photo, and that's it. So um, here's the create photo example from Wildside already. And it's on the photo manager class. So the photo manager class has a factory method called create photo which you provide some basic information, including the image. And then the photo class is instantiated, uh, initialized and returned to the caller. And that would be a factory method doing its job for its client. Given what I just uh, said, it should be really easy to answer this now. You want that factory method to create a new photo object. What's the best name? Make. Okay. New photo. Eh. Create photo. I like that best. Or create new photo. That sounds, that's redundant. New and create is redundant. So I think of these four options, create photo is the best because it uses a clear verb with noun and is as short as it can be. Uh, while still following the pattern that makes a reader quickly identify that must be a factory method. This method is obviously going to create an object of type photo and that's it. In some later lecture in this course, we will learn that object creation is actually quite a complex topic. So here I'm a bit short. I used the most common type of object creation method called factory method, but there are cloning methods. There are other types of how you can create objects and experienced developers will have a more fine grained vocabulary to communicate about those as well. Here's one more piece of advice. There's a common pattern where create promises to the caller that a new object will be created. So the returned object will be brand new. It's not going to be a reused or previously existing object. If the name of the method is ensure, or you should choose the verb ensure, uh, if it's not clear whether the object being asked for already exists and can be reused or whether it needs to be created. And sure has the uh, expected behavior of either the proper object will be found because it has previously been created or if not yet then 
it will now be created. So it works really well if you use a lot of lazy initialization. It's some sort of uh, lazy object creation you can realize if you name your methods and show. Finally, a uh, very common one, though it slowly is being adopted or being sucked into the, has been sucked into the programming language, um, assertion methods. Quite important. An assertion method is a method, is a helper methods, which tests a condition. And if the condition holds, the method returns silently, as if it never had been called. So if the condition holds, the control flow passes through as if nothing happens. But if the condition does not hold, does not hold, an exception is thrown. Some exception handling is triggered. So you use that to ensure uh, to uh, actually to pull out the testing of can we operate properly or is something wrong. You pull that out into an assertion method where you assert or ensure that uh, you can operate properly. So that's why well, the JDK has something like check permissions. I think uh, you should call them, you should start the method with assert and then follow by an expression that indicates the condition you're testing for. So in the homogeneous name example, we have, for example, the assert is valid index exception uh, uh, assertion method which asserts that the parameter is a valid index uh, to the current homogeneous name object and if so, passes through silently. So now after having run through the assertion method, you know that the parameter, the index i provided by the caller is a valid one and you can just use it without checking every time before you want to use it. But if it's not a valid index, if it's out of bounds, then an exception is thrown. So um, then you throw that index out of bounds exception. I think the method should be called assert and so forth. As you probably know, in Java, you have a keyword in the programming language, which lets you write so, those assertions. Um, but that specialized syntax may make it more easy to read or may make it harder to read. I still like assertion methods because they pull out the testing of the condition and the creation of an exception object uh, if so and the return and the throwing of that object into their own method and so you're not overloading the original method. Here is how it looks like. Um, uh, for the homogeneous name example, assert as valid index, uh, test the condition if i is less than zero or larger or equal than the upper limit, then the index out of bounds exception is thrown. Otherwise, nothing, uh, nothing happens. So um, one caller here is a simpler assert as valid index method, but of course it's mostly uh, the say set component method which should only do something useful if the index for the new component is actually a valid index. So it needs to assert it's a valid index and that's what you have the methods for that you can see on the screen here. So this was a quick run through the most important uh, method types structured into three main categories and you find them in Wildside, you find them in pretty much all Java programs, you find them in many other programming language. These are the most fundamental ones. Others come and go. Those are likely to stay for a long time, even if some of them uh, are even usurped into the language like, like assert, like the assert statement gives you one way of implementing assertion methods. So now on to the second aspect of methods, uh, which is that they can have properties. While method types uh, 
categorize or classify a method into one type and one type only, ideally, otherwise you're doing it wrong. Method properties is something uh, of which an object can have many. Um, not arbitrarily, but uh, still multiple properties. So a method property is a particular property of a method to be defined. Uh, and um, these method properties are usually orthogonal. So for example, uh, they have a, spe a specific topic. Abstract or not is one. Class or instance is another category. Um, inheritance interface is a third category. And within that category, um, you then have one of multiple values that the property can hold. So a method can only be abstract or not, it cannot be both. A method can be um, uh, a primitive method or a composed method as part of the inheritance interface, it can't be both. So you can have a property for from the perspective of the inheritance interface, from the perspective of, abs of abstractness, abstractedness, and from the perspective of the level you're arguing about class or instance, uh, but um, not multiple values from the same category. Like with method types, the value is that knowing these method properties and knowing the names they have been given makes you a more effective communicator makes you a faster and better developer who writes less buggy code. Here are the different types uh, with the different values that the property, the method property can be of. Um, there are probably other ways of uh, describing this, but since I'm the only one I know whoever put it down in this consistent form, this is also the only classification I'm aware of. So that's the basic, uh, what's the implementation related function of the method? Is it a regular? Uh, is it composed from multiple method? Or is it a primitive, meaning it assesses, accesses, handles one particular field and nothing else? Or is it a null method? That's it. So what is the implementation about? There is inheritance related. Um, how do you structure the inheritance interface, something we will be talking about later uh, in this course as well. So it could be regular, could be a template method, a hook method, or an abstract method. Um, so here I made abstract not its own property, but made it part of the inheritance interface. Uh, could be a convenience method of what type, then it could be meta level related. And of course, like with method types, sometimes the programming language already gives you some of these properties. Uh, all methods have some visibility, so public protected, package protected, or private in Java. Here is, um, again, uh, some examples, implementation, inheritance, and convenience. To understand some of this now, we need to expand the example the homogeneous name example because when it comes to implementation uh, rather than the outside interface we we'll quickly have subclasses and so we have a superclass and its subclasses and there's some interaction going on through the inheritance interface so we need to understand what an inheritance interface is. In a full-blown build out of homogeneous names you would have a name interface, which captures the functionality that's available to use clients. What can other objects call in terms of methods on a homogeneous name object? Then you would have an abstract name implementation of the name class, which captures all the methods, all the functionality that's common to any possible implementation of the name. And then you have subclasses of the abstract name superclass, which choose for different reasons, for example, different performance or different memory consumption, which choose different implementation state fields uh, to implement the name class. Most notably, that's our example, either a string array 
or an array of strings to capture the components of a homogeneous name or just a plain string that would be either string array name or string name as subclasses of an abstract name class which in turn captures the commonalities of the subclasses and implements the name interface. Naturally string name and string array name thereby also implement the uh, name interface. The abstract name class does not is abstract as you can see here that's at least our choice which means it doesn't have to be a full implementation but the subclasses string name and string array name they need to be uh, full implementations meaning all methods have an implementation so let's look at these different method properties uh, so uh, from an implementation, let's just implement a class perspective. A composed method is a method that has a purpose, has a task. It's the command method, for example, it could also be a query method. But in order to do its job, it needs to call on other methods. That's very common. So a composed method uh, is not primitive. That's the main alternative. Uh, and calls on other methods. So if you think about it from a control flow, control flow perspective, you know that if a method is supposed to be a composed method, control flow within the object will leave that method, will go to other methods of the object, possibly also composed methods, um, and so forth. This tree, the call chain, and the call tree, was starting from some entry point to the object, will be composed, composed, composed methods, and at the leaves of this tree, there will be the complementing primitive methods. Primitive methods do not call out other methods. Call out to other methods, composed methods do. I took this from Kent Beck's book on Pattern's book about small talk and common examples from, homogen from the homogeneous name examples, get component, insert, the obvious straightforward methods. Most of the meth half of the method, most of the methods are probably composed methods. So that's a property of a lot of object of, of a lot of methods. So here's the as string array, the um, Boolean query mess, the the the, <laughs> the um, interpretation or conversion method, and then there is the do insert method, which um, is complex in that it uh, um, calls on a number of other methods. Um, the primitive method is, um, actually let me take that back, I should have changed that here. Um, an insert method that first has a calls to an assertion method and then calls to the workhorse do insert method, um, that would be a good example of a composed method. Here, when you look at do insert, uh, in terms of um, calling uh, other methods, it calls get number of components. So yes, do insert here is a composed method because it calls at least one other method. But it's pretty close to what's next, uh, primitive methods. So a primitive method is a method with one task, not a composing task, really just one tasks, task, and does not rely on further methods of the object. So again, in that call chain or call tree, it's the leaves, it's where the control flow ends and returns to the caller. And most often primitive methods are methods that really just encapsulate a single field of the object and are required to be called if you want to get that value of the field and that's what they do. So, um, um, but not exclusively. So for example, arguably assertion methods are primitive methods because um, they really just test a condition and uh, for an exception. Um, you should design classes, I'm pulling something from later lectures forwards, by thinking about the primitive methods you need 
and then write lots of composed methods that use the primitive methods. It's called design by primitive and it's a good design principle for classes. So here is here are some examples. Uh, let's look at the middle do get component. Um, give me the component at index i uh, that in the case of the string array name implementation would simply access at index i in the string array uh, the components and return the value. As you can see, do get component does not call other methods. It's a primitive method. It is also a protected method, meaning other methods from the same object have been called before, before you can get to this protected method. Most notably, assertion methods have made sure that the parameter i, the index, is actually valid. You don't want to find out, or I want to have to test in the primitive method, that the arguments to the method call are invalid. So you make sure that they are valid beforehand. And when you look at the get component method above, you can see that the get component method is a composed method, calling the assertion method uh, first. And uh, that's method call one, and then calling do get component, that's the second method. So get component not only protects the do get component primitive method, but it's a composed method as well. Also of interest here, which will come in a few seconds, is that get component is implemented on the abstract name superclass and calls that primitive method do get component, which it only knows as an abstract method. In the abstract, the first top the, the top part here is the abstract name class and the do get component method is defined in the abstract there's only method signature but no implementation and then in the subclasses string name or string array name there are the specific implementations specific to the fields that are used to implement represent the homogeneous name uh, and as you can see there are two very different implementations. In the case of the string array name, you just go to the index i in the string array. In the case of the string name class, where the whole homogeneous name is in this full string, you have to parse the string perhaps, find the start position of the component i, find the end position, extract the string in there, and then return it uh, to the caller. So primitive methods are also the places that you define are also methods that you define in an abstract superclass to override them in subclasses uh, because they are the gateway to the implementation fields from specific implementation classes, often then subclasses. Which is where we had it now. So next property is uh, inheritance related. First, similar to a composed method, the big method properties, uh, whether a method is a template method or not. A template method has been designed, that this name has been given to us in the design patterns book, like factory method, and a template method is well uh, an algorithm, basically. Um, a skeleton, of uh, how to carry out uh, some task by composing it from multiple subtasks. So it's like a composed method. But the key distinction is that those subtasks, their implementation is not known to the class where you define the template method. So template method is a typical method that you implement in a superclass. It then relies on further methods, often primitive methods, which are available to the template methods only as abstract methods. And the template method expects, or the programmer of the template method expects that future or that subclasses will implement those primitive methods. And only then 
will the template method actually become uh, executable because the actual object will be an object, an instance of a subclass of the class where the template method is defined. So it's like a composed method, but the um, understanding is that the methods being called upon or a significant part of the methods are to be over to be are defined but not implemented in the same class and are to be overridden or to be implemented by subclasses. So an example from uh, the homogeneous name uh, class would be the get context name uh, method, where, which is basically give me the path name, uh, so the whole name without the last component. So um, here is uh, an example um, as string array. Um, um, is uh, implemented here in a superclass and is possibly overwritten in a subclass based on... Um, actually, that's not a great example, but I think um, uh, we will see many more, many more examples of a structured algorithmic skeleton and um, then how its different parts of the skeleton, different subtask steps will be implemented by subclasses. In the inheritance context, so I need to say that I'm using methods from implementation related and inheritance related close to each other, but they are all related within their own space. So um, the uh, composed method relies on primitive methods and template methods which delegates to what I in the previous slides called primitive methods actually has a slightly different understanding of those other methods it calls because it expects them to be overloaded or overridden by subclasses and then they may or may not be sub primitive methods though often they are primitive methods from the inheritance related perspective uh, these methods are then called hook method. So as you define a template method and an algorithmic skeleton, uh, you factor out into separate, usually abstract methods, uh, those subtasks that you need for the template method, but that you want subclasses to implement. And these other methods uh, then are called hook methods because that's how subclasses hook their code into the superclass. It's late binding and polymorphism and what have you, but the idea is on the superclass level where you define the template method based on other methods, these other methods become the hook methods that the template method or the implement of the template method assumes will be overridden by uh, subclasses. So hook methods thereby are usually much smaller. Um, often they are also in the implementation, the subclasses, primitive methods. That's why composed method and template method were as well as primitive method and hook method are so close to each other. So here again is um, the uh, uh, abstract name class, I believe, which has a generic implementation of as string array. So on the abstract name class, without knowing whether the homogeneous name is stored in a string or in a string array, you can actually implement a string array because you simply iterate over the components and pick them one by one using get component. But um, these, these methods, um, get number of components, get components, these methods uh, you have to ultimately defer to subclasses, which makes them uh, hook methods from the template method perspective. So as, as string array uh, is a template method, some more complex algorithm, and it utilizes two hook methods, get number of components and get components. These two methods are uh, 
<laughs> okay, the get number of components method is defined as a hook method because there is no good way here for implementing it on the abstract name level. The get component method is not yet a hook method, it's just another method, or another composed method, which, however, then in the next step relies on the after testing for, uh, after asserting that the parameters are valid, uh, utilizes the uh, an hook method called do get component, which then is overwritten uh, by subclasses, where it's either the single string or the string array from which the component is retrieved. Finally, we have uh, convenience methods, um, which make our lives easier. Uh, different forms of convenience method in general. There is simply uh, a convenience method because you feel some functionality keeps repeating and um, even though you could write it down every time yourself, um, it's just better to have a separate method for it. So for example, if the name class uh, often is called with uh, give me the first component, so you could always expect the caller to write uh, get component at index zero, or you make life easier and for convenience reasons uh, make the uh, caller not write zero or use the generic method, you just provide a get first component uh, method. That's a clear example of a convenience method. So just turning something like get component zero into get first component, which makes the client code read more easily. Anything that uh, makes code read more easily is good and probably worth writing down. Convenience methods often thereby provide, remove attributes, so then often so in the end, there will be lots of composed methods with multiple arguments, but they usually are often their default values for it. And convenience methods often have a reason of existence because they just provide a particular method, but with one less argument or two less arguments, where they then fill in the default value for, that, um, for those arguments. So the other example you can see here is uh, for a string name, you might want to have a generic interpretation or conversion method called as string, similar to or identical to what the JDK calls to string, but you may want that textual representation of the homogeneous name have sometimes have different delimiter cares. If you uh, are trying to represent path names, then maybe it's the slash or backslash you want as a delimiter care in between the components in the textual representation. But if it's uh, domain names or package names, then you want it to be the period. And if it's MAC addresses or so, maybe it's colons. So you should have a method where you can, as string method, where you can supply a delimiter care but maybe it's always a period. And so then you just make the period the default and uh, that's what you use. So that's actually, I think I, uh, um, so next up are uh, what I call default value methods here. Um, you often have default values. For example, the delimiter care for the homogeneous name or an escape care to escape special characters. And these uh, values have a default and you can certainly make them a constant in the interface. So in Java, you would write in all caps, default delimiter care or so. But if you codify it like this, you can't override it any longer. So you might want sometimes to uh, make it a method and have a subclass define what the delimiter care is for that type of subclass. And then you make it a method and that's what I call a default value convenience method here. So rather than uh, 
can still <laughs> you can still have um, uh, the static uh, values, but you should ask that they be that the method is being provided, that a method is being used to return those, or even drop the static final uh, values and just have the subclasses hard code them in the method. Finally, some uh, additional design guidelines. Let's start with a small exercise. What are these by category and property? What are these common methods? Maybe stop the video, look at them, try to use what you just learned and then I will go over it. So the first one, the clone method, the um, as a helper method, uh, falls from what we learned today into the factory method category, though I would argue it should be a more specialized creation method called cloning method. Um, the visibility, we didn't discuss that. We didn't discuss visibility as a method property, but you know this already, so that's protected. And um, uh, that's it. Next up, the equals method. That is a Boolean query method, obviously. And um, yep, that's exactly it. The finalized method is um, a command method. It's also protected and uh, carries out uh, the finalization of the object. Similar to the initialization, special variant of a command method or of a mutation method, you could argue there should be finalization methods and I could go along with that. So if you actually say in conversation with other developers, let's have a finalization method, take over this task, I think they'll understand. Get class is a simple getter and um, that's it. Uh, int hash code, well, that's, uh, that's our query method and that is uh, getter, just doesn't have a good name. Get hash code would have been nicer. Notify is a command method, notify all, uh, to a string is an interpretation method, wait, 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 are all, um, are all command methods. You can see that wait probably calls wait long timeout, which probably calls wait long timeout in nanos uh, internally. So wait and wait long time out are also convenience method. Methods build on the full blown wait method and supply default values for the missing parameters. So I want to drive home that uh, good code consists of methods and classes where the methods have one single purpose, not many, just one main purpose that is clearly and cleanly expressed in the name of the method. Everyone, everything else makes different people assume different things. And so one of them or all of them will write buggy code or lose time by looking into your method, trying to divine what it is you are trying to do. A good method name expressing that the method has a single purpose does not necessarily require the developer to look at the, its implementation. So it makes the method more easy to understand and makes it makes the classes built from methods more easily um, extensible. Uh, so overriding and subclasses makes it easier to custom tailor the class as well. There are, of course, um, no general rules without exceptions. Um, I'm not saying you should look for exceptions or invent your own, but there are common idioms that developers also understand. So for example, um, uh, iterators often have functions which are combining a getter, give me the current element, um, with a state change, a mutation, 
advance the pointer to the next element. These are highly idiomatic, increment and return. These are highly idiomatic uh, uses or situations. And hence, you should understand specifically these idiomatic uses, but not try to invent your own because they are limited and people generally understand them. If you were to invent new ones, they would not understand it. Um, you can make your method types and method properties explicit in code if you want to. It's not an established annotation scheme, but maybe someone should introduce it in, uh, in Java. Um, at least um, just use something as, as method type to make it even more explicit beyond the naming pattern of the method. What your methods do. So method types and method properties. Where method properties again can be multiple while the method type really should be one and one only. So with that uh, we discussed uh, method types. Well, a method can be of one type and should express what type it is and what purpose it has in its name. And then a method can have multiple properties Sometimes they are visible in the name, but often they are not. The main ones are how the implementation of the class is composed from these different methods and also how superclasses and subclasses via inheritance relate. These are the two main categories of method properties that you need to understand when you talk about the implementation of a class. Please follow the verb plus noun rule or just verb rule when designing, um, when designing methods. And of course, there are a couple of idioms that you need to know, like uh, the iteration idiom or lazy initialization, where you return a value and change the state, but at least not logically change the state. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'll see you in class or with the next video. Bye-bye.